Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you my standard review of the Voigtlander Apolanthar 50mm f2. I had a lot of requests to review this particular lens after my recent 40mm f1.2 and 110mm f2.5 macro Voigtlander lenses. And so one of you, Adam, decided you would help me out by sending me your own copy of this lens so that I could review it. And so please check out Adam's Instagram right here at this address and let him know how appreciative you are for making this happen for us all today. So this lens, of course, is a one that a lot of you wanted me to look at because it is a unique combination of truly compact. It's actually the same size as the, the diminutive Zeiss Loxia 50mm f2. So really compact, but it's packing a lot of optical prowess into that little package. And so it made it very interesting. Now, if you want all of the details, I recommend that you check out the definitive review here and uh, we break things down in more detail. Today, we're gonna give you just more of an overview, a more typical type review. And so if that's what you want, you're in the right place and let's jump into it. So as I've already noted, this is a really, really compact lens. It comes in at a weight of about 360 grams. And so it is uh, 20 or 30 grams heavier than the Loxia lens. But, um, and it's, it's, it's within two millimeters in length and a half millimeter in diameter. So it is beautifully compact, only about two and a half inches. It is quite lightweight, but it has got that unique density that comes with beautifully made all metal and glass lenses. And so while it is lightweight, you can tell that this is a premium lens just shrunk down into a really compact package. And so all of the typical aspects of a Voigtlander lens are there. It's a manual focus only lens, but it is a beautiful, beautiful manual focus operation with incredible smoothness, perfect damping to the focus ring between 120 and 130 degrees of focus throw, but focus throw that's spaced out really nicely. And so no matter what focus distance you're at, you have some room there for precision while not being so huge that it takes forever to rack from one end to the other. And so I actually found it a really easy lens to use as far as manual focus lens is going because of a great focus ring, a great focus throw. And then also on top of that, you have the electronic contacts and electronic communication, which also means that you get things like Sony's focus assist, where it will auto automatically magnify the you know, the portion of the image where you're focusing. And so that with other manual focus aids makes it really easy to get consistently good focus results. It does take more time than autofocus. And, and that's, that's an obvious thing at this point, but there are some of you that prefer that more deliberate focus process. There is also a manual aperture ring up near the front. Both of the rings, unlike a lot of mirrorless lenses, these are true mechanical couplings. And so when you focus, you're actually moving elements. When you change the aperture settings, you actually change the aperture iris settings. And so um, it is, if you're wanting to do video, for example, it actually is preferable here because you have more precision. You can actually, you have focus markings on the barrel. It's completely repeatable and linear in its operation. And so, I mean, there are situations where manual focus is preferable, just not all the time, I get that. And so everything is well executed there. I've got only two criticisms here. One of those is that this continues to be another Voigtlander lens without any kind of weather sealing. These are premium lenses. And I think that at this point, the market says it should have weather sealing. And so I'm gonna ding it for that. More of a systematic thing, however, is the lens hood design. And so the lens hood, like other Voigtlander lenses, and I'm not saying this as a knock, I own or have owned three different Voigtlander lenses. I've reviewed about six of them. I love them, but I don't love the lens hood design. They are threading on, and so they cannot be reversed for storage. Um, and you have to then use filter threads up near the front of the lens hood. So the downside of that is that you're left with basically a choice. You either leave the lens hood on all the time or you don't use it at all. Very few people are going to pack the lens hood along separately. And so I just don't see that happening very much. So I think for most people, it's gonna come down to one of those two choices. And so it really removes the convenience of being able to have that lens hood handy for when you want it without adding permanent extra length to the lens. So I will kind of ding them when it comes to that. 
Now, when it comes to the actual image quality, this is really an exceptionally good lens. So yeah, the compromise is at 50 millimeters, f2 is not a particularly large maximum aperture. I completely get that. And that is the compromise that they made to keep this lens so compact. They make up for that, however, by this lens being basically close to perfect wide open. At f2, you have great sharpness and contrast all across the frame. It is an aprochromatic design, and so what that means is that rather than correcting along two wavelengths of colors, it's three wavelengths, which results in basically no longitudinal chromatic aberration. Um, aberrations in general are very well controlled on this lens, and so you get amazing contrast and amazing precision in your color. Very richly saturated colors. I mean, look at how beautiful the color is on this shot here. and. Uh, but at the same time, it's not garish, it's not overdone. I just, I don't see other lenses producing as nice a color as what either Voigtlander or Zeiss lenses do. Something about the quality of the optical glass is special. And so, um, you know, stopping down, you get a little bit more contrast, a little bit more resolution at landscape apertures, but really it's, it's, it's splitting hairs at that point. It's, it's a little bit more, but it's already near perfect at F2. And so, of course, that helps a lot. Now, often the downside of an apochromatic design is that the bokeh quality isn't as smooth or soft. There's such amazing contrast on the lens that it's hard to get soft bokeh too. Fortunately here though, I feel like the quality of the blur is actually quite nice. And I saw in a number of situations images that I just thought were, were quite beautiful. You know, there were a few situations where the bokeh was a little bit busier, but frankly, I think that you're getting basically pretty close to as nice of bokeh as you do out of the Zeiss Loxia 50 millimeter F2, which is very, very good, while also getting more sharpness and more contrast at wide apertures. And so, uh, you know, it's really strong on that front. Flare resistance is also really good. And so even when panning across the sun, you'll see there's very little loss of contrast, very little ghosting, and even stop down, it is quite good. Aperture here is 12 aperture blades. And so one kind of negative aspect of their aperture design is that they use straight aperture blades. Now I actually find that the effect isn't as bad here because of the higher blade count. You, get a, you still get a nicely circular shape, you know, when stopped down, but you will see those kind of hard edges, almost like the teeth on a saw blade, you know, uh, in a very minor kind of way. And so, um, but the, the upside of that is that those straight aperture blades also produce really, really nice sunburst or sun star effects. And so, um, as you can see here, that's a really, really nice end result and better than what you typically get from lenses with curved aperture blades. So at the end of the day, it is a different design philosophy, you know, with that smaller maximum aperture, being manual focus, all of those things. It, you don't see a lot of aprochromatic 50 millimeter lenses. However, one of those that you will see out there, not quite 50 millimeters, but 55 millimeters is the Zeiss Otis, 55 millimeter f1.4. And so at the end of the day, this is an expensive lens. It is 1,050 US dollars, which is a lot for you know, if you look at the overall dimensions and you, you know, on paper, you're saying, okay, it's uh, a manual focus only 50 millimeter lens with a maximum aperture of F2. Why would I pay that amount for it? You know, and for a lot of you, I get it. It's not going to make sense to pay that kind of money for it. Let's not kid ourselves though. Not all lenses are created equal and there's more to it than just the specs on a page. There's something that is truly special about the image quality from this lens. And so if you want a compact lens, you know, for your shooting style, maybe you want something discreet and low profile, but you want amazing image quality, this might be worth the money for you. And here's the way that I, if you want a way to justify it in your own head, I see a lot of the same attributes in this lens optically that I see in a Zeiss Otis lens. Except for you're talking about a quarter of the price and about a third of the size, you know, or maybe even close to a quarter of the size. And so at the end of the day, that makes it a little bit easier to justify in your mind. This is a premium lens. It's tiny, yeah, but it is amazing optically. And so maybe, just maybe, it might be the lens that you've been looking for. If you want more information, check out that definitive review. You can also take a look in the description down below and uh, check out my full text review. There's also a link there to an image gallery, which 
may sell the lens all on its own. Beyond that, there's also buying links if you want to purchase one for yourself and linkage to follow me on social media. You could become a patron, sign up for my newsletter. And of course, if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button right here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.